Hi guys. Thanks for joining once again. Um, so listen, we're going to do things a little bit differently from now on where I'm going to introduce the person who I'm going to interview in a little video like this one before I throw to the interview itself. It just got like excruciatingly awkward when I tried to roll that into my interview with them and they had to sit there like a stunned mullet while I told them about themselves and their long list of accomplishments. Um, not a good use of their time or your time. Uh, all my time, frankly, so we're just not going to do that anymore. Let me instead tell you about the incredible human being who I had the privilege of interviewing earlier today. His name is Professor Tony Young. He is many things. He is an academic who obtained his PhD in physiology. He is a clinician. He's a consultant and practicing urological surgeon and National Clinical Director for Innovation at NHS England. Actually, in 2019, he received an OBE or an Order of the British Empire for his services to clinical leadership. And as equal as anything, he is an entrepreneur. He has founded four medtech startups of his own. He co-founded the 500 million pound Anglia Ruskin medtech campus, and he's combined all of those to now run the clinical entrepreneur program for the NHS, where he's doing some incredible work. I was left feeling like I don't know what I'm doing with my time. If he can accomplish all of that, I hope you are left feeling inspired. He is truly a remarkable human being, and I hope that you enjoy this one. You made it. OK, hey. great. And I had the button. Oh, hang on, hang on. I've got the wrong headset. In my... Sorry. Right, go on. You want to start? Let's start. Uh -huh. Oh, sure. Well, that is starting. I feel like the at least outwardly, the values of a doctor of the medical profession, you know, with the Hippocratic Oath and whatnot are one thing. And then the values of an entrepreneur are outwardly another thing. I was curious to know if there if you see them as one, if there are certain aspects that you, that you identify with more. Is your vibe? So I think you can see by my uh, midbrain body language that the um, <laughs> I'm kind of going, well, I see what you're saying because when you look at this, um, you know, at face value, you might say the values of a clinician and the values of the entrepreneur are kind of opposing and perhaps mismatched. Um, and I can see why people would think that, but does that kind of creative tension is it well is it a creative tension rather than just a destructive tension that's going to pull things apart i i, I why does it why do answers have to be binary i think and, and do you know there's this thing isn't there in psychology where the paradox two opposing things that don't you go you know they're okay on their own but when you bring them together they can't be true the clinician and the entrepreneur i think on our clinical entrepreneur program at nhs england We've shown that if you take the core values of people who went into medicine and clinical practice and become experts in that, and then you give them entrepreneurial skills, what happens is that the um, uh, you uh, uh, create some of the leaders in the world in the healthcare and life sciences space. I'm not sure what I can do because trumpet practice is going on next door with my 16 year old. So you're about to hear that. If that's a problem, I can see what this I can do. This is Humans of LinkedIn. It's a good, so um, you started actually with a clue as to my next line of questioning, which was around the midbrain. We went down like a real rabbit hole last time we spoke about Daniel Kahneman and crocodiles and the midbrain. And I would love for you to give us like a brief history of the brain and why as humans we make the decisions that we do. When I first um, was about to start at NHS England, you know, it was, fairly daunting for me, a clinician who'd been asked to take a um, leadership role for a whole nation's healthcare innovation. Um, and I recall sitting, I was having a dinner at this society, on the, you know, associated with this medical society, and I happened to sit next to the head microbiologist for the Welsh government. And he was a very senior guy and I was I don't know, 10 years younger than I am now. And um, uh, we were explaining what we did with each other um, and the um, uh, his role and his experience of working across government. He said, gosh, that's an enormous role you've taken on um, there, Tony. He said, um, uh, do you know, he said, if there was one thing I would read if I was you, 
it's Thomas Lewis's book on a general theory of love. And I said, why, why would I need to know about the psychological theory of love? He said, oh. he said, because people don't just fall in love with other people, they fall in love with systems, products, processes, those kinds of things. And if you're going to be the leader of innovation for a nation, it's not just about telling people what to do. That's not how it works. It's about making them fall in love with what you want them to do and the changes that need to be made. The people talk about winning hearts and minds. Hearts are really midbrain structures and minds or your technical thought process is more your kind of neocortical structures. You believe that anybody can change the world and it doesn't matter where they come from. What what was it that led you to that belief? Who am I? So I'm I'm you know, I am a uh, have been called a plumber from Essex. So Essex, the county I live in, in England, is known for lots of great tradespeople. You get a really high quality plumber if you go to Essex, but I'm a human plumber. So I'm a urologist in South End. Um, and I've um, now, as far as I'm aware, the only clinician that leads a whole nation's healthcare innovation um, and see some of the most amazing things that will be transformative for people's lives. And so many people have this kind of, um, some people call it imposter syndrome, some people call it self judgment of, oh, I can never do this or be that. And, you know, I come from, I was the first in a generation, or first in my family ever to go to university. That had never happened before. Um, and, and where does self belief come from? Well, this, uh, uh, why do you, why should I think that I'm someone who can impact people's lives across the world? Who, who do I think I am to think that? Well, there was this little old lady who, when I was family friend, in fact, Frida's husband married my wife and I. Um, and uh, but when I was a little boy, Frida would just uh, who was she? She was Frida, a little old lady who lived near us, and we'd known her ever since I was aware. Um, and would sit me on her knee and say, "You can be anyone from anywhere, and you can change the world." And when you're little, and the people you respect tell you that, you kind of you accept it. It's just, that was normal. Frida told me that. I believe her. She's lovely. And it wasn't till I went to medical school that I saw the documentary made by the BBC on a programme called Panorama on Frida, um, uh, that I found out that she was a lab technician. And you might say, lab technicians don't change. Well, well, she was a lab technician in the 1940s and 50s at King's College London for Rosalind Franklin. And as uh, your listeners may be aware, Rosalind Franklin was the person who conducted the experiment, um, the X-ray uh, crystallograph, uh, experiment that was produced that showed the structure of DNA. But it so Rosalind designed the experiment, but it was actually her head lab technician, Frieda, who'd carried it out. And Rosalind never saw the result of that experiment. She left King's College and it was filed away. So when Crick and Watson visited King Morris Wilkins, the head of lab at King's College London, Frieda brought the results along, showed the, with great pride the work that she'd been instructed to carry out by Rosalind Franklin. And of course, the penny dropped for Crick and Watson and DNA was discovered. And so kind of uh, when that happened, I just felt connected to medical and scientific history that the woman who'd conducted the experiment that helped up, we'd have discovered DNA at some point. These were just the first people who did it and that penny dropped. And I thought, Frida, you changed the world. I didn't know. So what you told me when I was little was true. And if Frida can do it, why can't I do it? Why can't anyone do it? You do an important job. I feel like I've got to get you back to that. So are you ready for, I've got a fast five questions for you. Oh, I'm okay, you okay. <laughs> well, come on then. All right, first one. Do you consider yourself to be a normal person? Oh no, yeah, that's really easy. I <laughs> cling on to the edge of the normal spectrum by my fingertips. Being in the middle is, uh, well, it's, it, I, I'm a change happens at the edges. Um, and I've, have I always wanted to be part of the crowd? There's part of me that does want to be in the middle and be accepted. But the other half of me says the really exciting stuff happens on the edges. That's where the, the mutation in evolution is the mutations that take us forward, isn't it? And do that. I'm definitely not normal. Would you take a pill that made you remember everything? I embrace my gut on these things and so my automatic response is no, I'd be trying to go against evolution and this great biological experiment that we are.
What's something you look forward to every week? Oh, one thing is difficult. It's trumpet so, practice. <laughs> yes, I think that might be over now. Um, <laughs> I love spending time with my family. We have the beach a couple of hundred yards at the end of my road, going on long walks to that, whatever the weather's like. And at the, we're at the mouth of the Thames estuary. Um, so just as it comes in on the North Sea to make its way to London and the um, the weather, the sunsets and sunrises, I think I probably would struggle to live away from the coast now because it is just so when you're in front of something that is bigger and greater than you, it's inspiring and it helps you to put, put you and your troubles and issues into perspective. So I love getting out into the blue and into the green and being inspired each day. Do you believe in an eye for an eye? Oh, another quick one. Um, my gut feeling is no. One of the uh, greatest privileges of my life has been having incredible mentors. Um, and if I had to give one tip to people, it would be find an amazing mentor and learn from them. And I've had different ones in different sectors when I've been in academia or in clinical practice or in leadership um, where I found a different one. And the truly generous people with their time and I've, I've learned from them um, in uh, in great ways. And uh, they're the most humble people. And one of the things I've observed is I can't, I'm trying to think of a time when any of them ever went into a head to head confrontation, which is your eye for an eye. So winning without and before that you don't even go on the battlefield. If you go, my experience is sometimes when you've gone on the battlefield, you've already lost. Sorry, does that answer the question? Not a one word answer, is it? Sorry. Yeah, I need to rebrand these and not fast back at all. <laughs> They're fast for me. I just have to get the question out. <laughs> my final one is very highbrow. Uh, I'm interested to know what guided your outfit choice today. Um, hey, uh, so uh, what was clean in the wardrobe? I think that's, that's enough. That's it. <laughs> that was your brainstem, definitely. <laughs> no, it's just fulfilling your basic needs, isn't it? <laughs> I really no, enjoyed my, my time with you today. Oh, thank you very much.